he came up to me and credited me for helping him with an exam that helped him to get into university. And it's the real core memory uh, of mine that made me realize that while 99% of online discourse can be incredibly toxic, there is, if you look out for it and you find the gems, there is so much fantastic information uh, online that is being given for free. All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to One Story Building, where stories happen sometimes. Today's guest is comedian, YouTube funny man, and somebody with upside down hair. That's really the best I could come up with for a, for a funny <laughs> third joke thing. It's Jacob Truman. Welcome <laughs> to One Story Building. All right, great to be here. You know, I'm actually quite surprised that I haven't spoken to you earlier because for the longest time, I have thought that you and I were kindred spirits. Where oh, really? around about the same age, we right. both studied film and then eventually transitioned into live stage stuff. Mm -hmm. We're both firm atheists. We <laughs> look mildly similar. And we both. I did used to look like you. I did used to look yes, like you did, before yeah. I lost my hair. With, and with, put on with oh yeah, I mean it's 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 being cut there and growing down the back. So as long as I I, I just need to <laughs> sh shove it back there. Anyway, you've you've got a mighty beard going on. It's all right. Mm -hmm. It does it does what I have what I need it to. Mm -hmm. um, fills in some some empty space. <laughs> if I didn't have a beard, I'd look like yeah. a big toe. You know, toe, yeah, toe, egg, sure. <laughs> but but mo most importantly, between you and me. We both started making YouTube videos at around about the same time, around about oh, 2009. Right? But back in the day, back in the day with your yeah. old Latham Way YouTube channel videos. So for my yeah. sake, could you please regale us on what YouTube was like for you back in 2009, all those years <sighs> ago? Well, you know what? It's it's a distant memory at this point. Um, I remember just seeing people making videos about things that were just interesting to me and thinking, hey, that's interesting, I can do that. But also, crucially, hey, that's interesting, but I could do better. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that I, I would stand by that and say that that was the case. And other times it was probably hubris. Um, but it, whatever the reason, I, it just influenced me to start recording myself, spewing my opinions um, about things, many of which I uh, agree with still and retain. Some in some areas I've evolved and changed. That's just growing up, I suppose. Um, that was really what motivated me to join. And it was a bit of a um, back then in the early days of YouTube. You know, I don't know if you can call it that. Subjectively, my early days of YouTube, it was definitely a lot more community based. It wasn't so corporate. Um, the small pocket of YouTube that as I was part of. Having over a thousand YouTubers mm. was like a big deal. Um, so yeah, that can give you an idea of the sort of the context we were talking. Um, yeah, it was just very individual, one on one. There wasn't as much of a sort of a massive community, sort of fandom based aspect of things. Um, yeah, I don't know much more than that. I, I, I don't, I'm not sure what else to say about it. Like I said, it's a bit of a distant memory at this mm. point. Yeah, you you really just summed up my points when you say that there was so much of a community going on because it the the true monetizable potential of YouTube wasn't realized mm. until years later. But I um I remember the five star ratings, which eventually went away because essentially yeah. it it was the like and dislike because something was either five stars or one star. No one really thought about it that much. But yeah. I I really miss video responses that were attached. Yeah. To the video like comments and i still don't know why youtube got rid of it well they i remember when it happened they i remember reading specifically that it's it was to them from their perspective a very unused feature very 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 few people ever made a video response in comparison to all the video that they were churning through and so i suppose from that perspective they just saw it as sort of a frivolous detail that they didn't see any point continuing for the people who really benefited from it from the communities from the little pockets of youtube that really sort of like engaged with it it was not necessarily integral but it was a very useful and sort of community-based feature which just disappeared as youtube developed and changed and evolved it's a bit of a shame mm -hmm. and i do miss it you're right yeah yeah 
the biggest difference between your back in the day videos and my back in the day videos is that my back in the day day videos are gone because I just <laughs> moved on. This is my fourth channel. I've had like five different internet names, um, but I, I didn't delete them because I was embarrassed or ashamed by them. Maybe I should have been, but I wasn't really. I was just <laughs> done with them. So I went onto the channel and privated, unlisted, deleted some of them. But your old YouTube channel, d d videos on Leighton Way, they're all still there. And as much there as- There are some, I, yeah, yeah. As, as some were- Many, most, I would say. And as much as I went back for research purposes to watch some of these videos, no one is going back to your old library and watching your old videos. <laughs> the, the, there are videos of yours that have about a, a thousand views. No offense, but they're never going to hit 2,000 views no. ever, <laughs> ever. So wh why are they still there? Oh, laziness. <laughs> I mean, honest to God, like a part of me is just about being accountable and you know, why would I get rid of them? I don't, there's a, like I said, it was a, it's a channel based on having strong opinions about things. And for the most part, there's a lot of opinions that I still broadly agree with. I will say, you know, word to the wise, I have uh, privated a few of them that I look back on and I think, mm, my opinions have changed, or maybe I put that in words that I wouldn't use today. Uh, that's definitely a process that uh, has happened. But for the most part, I'm not really that fussed about them being on there. Um, I don't really feel a need to move properly move on, really. I mean, my channel, if I really had one right now, is just called Jacob Truman. It's just my name. Um, and that's my second channel. My Layton Way was my first one, mm -hmm. first proper one where I was actually uploading things, talking to people and talking about things. Um, so I don't know. I just never felt the need to. Is it laziness? Who knows? Maybe that's it. It's probably multifaceted. <laughs> You you did have a series of videos called something to, to the effect of things on YouTube that piss me off, and they're gone. I like those videos. Yeah. Why, why 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 them specifically to be gone? Um, some very sort of two thousand and nine language that I don't really appreciate, and I don't want to represent me in the modern age. Um, it's not that I disagree with the comedy of it. Um, there were some really good moments that I really enjoyed. There was a specific moment that a friend of mine, Tom. Uh, Tom Scar, I'm not sure if you'll ever if you're I, aware I know of him. of him, yes. Um, he will always bring up the fact that when he was watching my stuff, because we went to the same university and he sort of knew me by face, um, when he was would bring us up the stuff that he likes and he remembers that series, he always remembers when I, I talked about people who would tell me that they were unsubscribing as if I gave a single <laughs> solitary shit. And if it mattered to me at all, and I illustrated that by, at the time I had like, I don't know, 2,000 uh, subscribers and I measured up bowls of water mm. and jugs with 2,000 uh, milliliters, two liters, and just took a spoonful out and dropped mm. it on the floor and was like, that's how little you mean to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I remember being quite, <laughs> everyone quite, seemed to quite like that. That was an enjoyable moment for me. Very petulant, but, you know, mm -hmm. of its time. Yeah, well, uh, you, uh, of of its time, and that that brings me to my my next uh, philosophical question: Is in your 2010 Leighton Way Le Leighton Way video, which was called "Is My Brother a Communist?" You decide. <laughs> your your extremely talented and handsome twin brother said yeah. this about you. <clears throat> This is what Jacob does. Since he is becoming more apt and better acquainted with political theory and ideas and political <laughs> concepts, he is trying to apply them to inane, stupid things <laughs> like who gets to go on the PlayStation 3 and for how long. And yeah. I felt called out. I think this is what's <laughs> happening to our generation. As we've been fed this digital diet of the nostalgia critic or the Ricky Gervais show and just Twitter in general. It's how do you think the last two decades of this sort of cutting critical media has warped us into these argumentative, abrasive douchebags? Um well I was always an argumentative abrasive douchebag. Maybe I should go to therapy and seek the source of that. Um, I've mellowed out somewhat these days, but it's really more about uh, my reasoning for doing it was just that I felt like, I guess, on some level I had something to say. And I felt like the things that were being said, sometimes I could have said them better, as I said earlier. Um, but you are right. The 
uh, the internet spawned a whole vernacular and vocabulary to, of terms that people have used and, ab and abused uh, for their own ends. That was really, I remember that day, actually, because we'd had a big uh, conversation and a big, well, I say conversation, argument over PlayStation usage. And it just sort of fizzled out and became a joke about, you know, how we could apportion things equally, each to their need and, the, and, the mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and I remember that very clearly. That was um, that was uh, that might have been early on in our first year of university. Actually, we're definitely in a university dorm in that video, aren't we? Uh, possibly. We it, was, it, it was in yeah. 2010. Well, you, yes, university that would have been dorm, university. Then. It, 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 it could have been a university dorm. It could have been a a, a London apartment. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it was definitely university, which means that we were really, really getting into it with who deserved what amounts of time on PlayStation. <laughs> Good Lord, those were the days. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I think about how YouTube was back in the day compared to how mm -hmm. YouTube is now in the current day, I yeah. see uh, cooking channels, gardening channels that have millions of, of um, subscribers and definitely comparing them back to 2009 when there was a bit more of a less corporate, more community feel going on. Some of the channels that I see, some of the videos they put out, it's like television and i mean that in a pretty complimentary way it looks it's yeah. shot in such a professional way as if in as as if it was like a tv show that you'd see your mum watching in, in in 2004 at 6 30 at night mm -hmm. so as someone who started making videos in your university dorm and then eventually transitioned into sketches with you know lighting and everything and scripts and production values how have you seen YouTube change over the past 15 years? Uh, well, I think the broad strokes of it is that, you know, when YouTube was first sort of becoming popular, it was just an opportunity for a lot of people, myself included, to sort of feel like we had a voice and connect with people all around the world. And like I said, it was a community-based sort of feel to it, far less corporate um fall it was more people on the same level in the same community there were people who were at different levels in their channel and different numbers of subscribers but for the most part it was lots of different people doing the same thing or talking about the same things on a mostly equal level whereas now you have big youtubers who you know many of them have been grinding and grinding for years but big youtubers often get big very quickly and then they have a massive audience and a fandom and then there'll be names for the members of the fandom and it's more like you know pop stars and stuff like that and celebrities more than anything that i i remember very very clearly that as time went on that sort of individualistic individualistic way of approaching youtube slowly started to be chipped away um at the start it felt like it was being built up the partnership program program came in and people were making money from youtube and everyone was like oh my god this is incredible but then, you know, it started to be changed. Video responses were taken away, which I'm sure made perfect sense to them from their business perspective. But for the communities who really utilized them and enjoyed using them, it was just another way that YouTube changed for the worse. Um, there was a peak in sort of like the enjoyment of YouTube when it was very engaging that you would go to YouTube meetups and, oh, right, uh, and you would meet people in real life that you hadn't you never interacted with and you never would have interacted with, especially with people that I was around, people who were making comedy sketches, people like Tom Scar, Jack and Dean, uh, people like that. Um, it definitely felt like there was a peak of YouTube around that time, maybe 2012, 13, 14, 15, around that sort of era, uh, when things really felt very, very vital and, uh, and like there was a healthy level of... Um, interest and engagement with the community that was on some level you know egalitarian on maybe that's just me speaking subjectively but it did start to trail off and it started to really move towards the sort of like very sort of like top down you've got the big youtuber and then the and the audience and they're all in this one group and the youtubers at the top uh and you just slowly that sort of like network aspect community individualistic as aspect of youtube just ceased to exist and it it hasn't it's never really come back i mean part of it is just the monetization aspect of it as soon as corporations realized 
that they could make serious amounts of money off of this if they, you know, streamlined it, pro- treated it differently. Um, I think I think the real I think the real nail in the coffin was the the uh, what was it with PewDiePie, his big controversy that led to the uh, adpocalypse or whatever it was called when I when he was, was playing a game and he and he said a naughty word. He used yeah he used a naughty word yeah. and the ad ad uh, companies that had always been happy to be, to be on YouTube realized that their ads were being served against videos with which were getting millions and millions and millions and millions of views from lot. From, from lots and lots of people uh, and the people who were making the videos had no oversight and were saying all sorts of crazy stuff. And as a result, they just pulled out. And mm-hmm. I think that was the last time that YouTube really felt in any way democratic. It just felt like YouTube just pitched. And it makes sense for them as a business. I understand. Um, but from the perspective of, of a consumer of YouTube, of a, an organic YouTuber, if you talk to people who were in that sort of community, Back in the day, it's just it changed. It just gradually got more and more corporate and involved and streamlined. And yeah, that the part of YouTube that I grew up on doesn't exist anymore. Mm. It really doesn't. Yeah, I I do think that YouTube did peak in around about the 2011, 12, 13 area. That's that's when it it became big. But not too big. And mm-hmm. in in 2012, you uploaded a video called Arguing on the Internet, Is It Worth It? And you referenced a moment where you bumped into someone who recognized you in, in real life. And they said yeah. that they were able to pass a university entrance exam using information yeah. that they got from one of your videos. Now, I'm not yeah. going to lie and be your lovey-dovey and say that you, you as in the plural you, people in general, make yeah. YouTube videos or or make any sort of content like that to help other people and that's it. For the most part, it's a part of it, it's a it's a personal hobby and you make the content that you would want to see. However, yeah. stuff like that has got to be pretty inspiring so how does stuff like that meeting people in real life and seeing that you're affecting people how does that change and motivate you to make the content well that specific uh experience was very odd in and of itself i think i don't know how much detail i went into in in the video but i'd had a really rough few days at work and i'd been i was still living in lincoln in my university trying to sort of see if i wanted to put roots down in Lincoln, obviously did not happen. Um, and I was really, really struggling. I was, I'd, I'd missed a shift or I'd come in late and I'd got an absolute bollocking from my boss. It was not a fun time. And I was ordered to go upstairs onto the top level because I was working at the cinema and sweep the floors because there was po- popcorn everywhere. And I don't know if you've ever tried to sweep popcorn off of a carpeted floor with a broom. <laughs> it's impossible. <laughs> so I was really, really down at one of my lowest points. Um, at that <laughs> at that time in my life, I was not feeling very good about myself at all. And then this movie let out, and I sort of shuffled to the side, and I was like, "Oh God, I'm just the I'm just a little drone, the worker bee who's who's helping them en- enjoy their time at the cinema. No one notices me." And then someone tapped me on the shoulder, and I spun round, and me in my horrible Odeon uniform, and he was like, "Are you Leighton Way or Jacob or whatever?" He called me, and I was like, "Yes." And he went, uh, you uploaded a video about whether or not the UK can be considered a Christian nation. Uh, and I watched it the night before my general studies exam. And because I had watched that, I was able to have a good answer on my general studies exam, which gave me enough what they called UCAS points to get into university. So I just want to say thank you, man. And I was like, OK, okay cool. And he just walked off. And all I could take from that was that I'd helped... Literally, I'd, I'd helped a guy get into university. And I don't know the exact specifics of what 100% happened. Maybe he was just being nice. Maybe he knew more about it than he really thought he did. But he came up to me and credited me for helping him with an exam that helped him to get into university. And it's, it's a real core memory uh, of mine that made me realize that while 99% of online discourse can be incredibly toxic, there is, if you look out for it, and you find the gems, there is so much fantastic information uh, online that is being given for free. And the fact that I could have been one of those people to help somebody in that way, literally just because I wanted to 
involve myself in a question about the nature of religion in the you know cogs of our government in the in the UK that me just wondering about that and wanting to make a little sort of video essay sort of thing uh that was a great feeling obviously that's a great feeling and it definitely sort of has a parallel when you're making comedy and people are telling you how much they love their <laughs> your comedy videos as well yeah well hey just just coming from me uh you you mentioned the video that's now gone where you il- illustrated your subscribers with the bowl of water <laughs> i i remember the video you you had like a a soup spoon like yeah. or, or, or like a teaspoon and you went sploosh and you were yep. like fuck you and like I, it's it's in my in my memory because i i started watching you before. they love a bit of abuse sometimes you've got to dole it out sometimes we have to be you have, you have to be honest you have to not be <laughs> sycophantic to your to your crowd exactly but i i started watching you before i i don't think i was even 20 when i started watching your stuff and i mm. in a way grew up watching you and other people and phrases that you have said just sort of circle yeah. in my in my mind. I I felt the oldest that I have ever felt when I started to see the age of YouTube videos, where it was like this was uploaded blank years ago. When it got to ten, when it got to double digits, that's when I was like, man, I'm I'm getting old. YouTube's getting old. Yeah. But um, like the <laughs> phrases that you've said, things that I've seen you do all the way back when when you had, when you had hair. It's like when a kid remembers a cartoon theme song it's just sort of in my head forever like the sploosh fuck you or i'm almost done with our toothbrush it fell in dog shit michael (laughs) we were outside just these phrases that 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 circle around so yeah i mean i i know that you haven't met all of your digital fans but you know you've you've influenced a lot of people myself included that's why i'm here talking to you fantastic i mean especially someone on the other side of the world that's just that's just mind-boggling mm-hmm. in a way. No, yeah, well, that's that's um, YouTube for you. Uh, so eventually, after after 2013, when you were done with Latham Way, and uh, the yeah. the channel did mean a lot for for you apparently because you've got yeah. a, a Latham Way T-shirts and you, um, you yeah. maybe you've held on to that. Uh, you started. Yeah, I have actually. Um, oh, good. It's yeah, it's in a plastic bag somewhere. I can't really get bring myself to throw it away, mm. um, but I, I won't be out wearing it anytime soon. And after after late and way you started fratocrats and that's correct as of me checking this weeks ago to have a look at it it was at 27000 subscribers and it uh-huh. started as a sketch comedy channel and then you started yeah. a new segment called Twin, called twin joke where it was yeah. like a bunch of wacky segments for, and and for the most part that wasn't scripted and then during yeah. the last half of the last season of Twin Joke, yeah. a, a new segment showed up in Twin Joke called Make the Fratocrats Argue, which was just you yeah. and your brother arguing. And then after yeah. that, after Twin Joke mm-hmm. in 2018, you started The Truman Show, which was mm-hmm. just you and your brother arguing. You've so done your research. I, 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 it's, it's, it, this is a fun little gig for me because I get to watch entertainment for <laughs> work. For research. Yeah, yeah. For, for research, yeah. So comparing the green screens and costumes from early Fratocrats to later Fratocrats where it was two people in a, ro- in, in a room talking, how does it feel understanding now that production values and effort means nothing? <laughs> you know what? It became very real for us because um, that channel, we loved doing it, but we were putting so much effort into it. And the amount of engagement we were getting back was, you know, we it's the balancing act of like, yes, we, we love hearing people say, you know, we love your stuff. And especially when people say that we inspire them to do their own stuff is also incredible. Um, but you do want you know, to get some success and get followers and subscribers and views. And we just weren't getting as much as we would have liked compared to a lot of the other people we were around. And we realized we were putting in so much effort. I remember there was a segment in Twin Joke um, where there was a large, uh, we had some, we had Mike in a large costume. Um, uh-huh. Oh, he was, he was pretending I... to be a suppository who uh-huh. had been in the Vietnam War. That, that's yeah. that, that's literally the next thing that I'm going to bring up. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> surprised right. you 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 mentioned it. I should, should I bring, it, bring it up right now, or do you have something else to say? By all means, by all okay. means. Okay. <clears throat> Series 3, Episode 12, 
of Twin Joke, you did a quiz show little segment and you introduced a character, Roy, also known as Shitballs McFucklecunt. And well, um, overall, the joke was that it was like a kid's quiz show with this funny mascot, yeah. goofy looking guy walking in who mentions that he's in the Vietnam War. He was like a war vet. And whenever yeah. you would mention the word Vietnam, he would freak out. Now, maybe I was just extremely tired. But when I was watching this, I was on the floor, metaphorically, <laughs> laughing, literally. And at the time, I was actually kind of ashamed because it was just so fucking stupid. <laughs> but then <laughs> I, I I watched it again and laughed almost as much, but I was still laughing. And I, I thought there has to be something going on here. Why is this just so funny? So I, I analyzed it. And I think it is such a perfect sketch because it has the classic foundations of comedy. And that is it has the structure of a quiz show with the chaos of a goofy character with a guest right. who didn't seem prepared for the chaos of the goofy character. Because comedy, yeah. I'm just reading from a script now, comedy <laughs> is when tension breaks. If it wasn't a quiz show, it wouldn't have been funny and it wouldn't have worked. It's like how Ooh. the funniest bits of um, improvised comedy is when they mess up. But if it was just them messing up the whole time, that would just be stupid and crap and it wouldn't be funny. So the question is, when you're coming up with the idea of shitballs McFuckle cunt, did it? Did your analysis of trying to make it funny go as deep as what I said just then? No, not okay. even slightly. <laughs> um, our, like I said, circling back a little bit to what you were saying earlier, we got that uh, costume um, from our job. We both, me and Mike, both worked at the same place back in the day, and they were throwing away. <laughs> I don't know how they got their hands on it, but it was a giant costume of Mister Chips, who is a mascot from Catchphrase. Um, which is a TV show we have in the UK. I don't know if you have it in Australia. Um, and we decided, to, they were like, does anybody want it? And we were like, yeah, we'll have it. We'll use it in a sketch or something. And we spent so long disguising it so it wouldn't be a massive ripoff and changing the colours and painting it. And we were realising, oh my God, we're putting so much effort into this and it's gonna, probably not going to do very well. But we thought it was funny because the idea of that, of, of well, basically, we got it, and when we stripped all the details back, it kind of looked like a suppository. And I don't know how we then moved on to this suppository had been in the Vietnam War, but it was it was a pretty organic um, orig origin for story for Roy. Um, and trust me, there was no theory or discourse uh, behind it whatsoever. Um, the funny thing is that we did it; we thought it was hilarious. And we regularly get comments about it from people who uh, consider themselves as fans of our work. Um, but at the time, it felt like so much hard work in, mm. put in for so little on the way back. And it really, really upset us. But it was a really funny, really mm. funny sketch. And I, I do watch that occasionally. It's a really good segment. I'm glad you brought that one up, actually. Mm. When I when I make my own videos and I'm editing mm -hmm. them, you said that you go back and watch you watch that and maybe you watch some of your other videos. I cannot stand to watch my own videos. However, yeah. when I'm editing them, I'm I'm watching through it. I'm watching myself do stuff and I'm laughing along at my funny stuff and it, and it's great. But then mm -hmm. when I upload it, when it becomes public, I then become self conscious to watch it. Do you know what mm. might be going on there? Well, I can watch it in the editing suite, but I can't watch it online. Well, you know what? The entire time that I've been making videos like that, people have been saying like, oh, I upload videos, but I never watch them. Oh, I just can't watch myself. I don't watch my own videos. And I'm always sat there like, I watch my videos all the time. <laughs> and it's not, I was wondering whether it was like self-consciousness or self-centeredness even. Um, but I don't know if that's it. I just like, a lot of the time when I make my videos and, the ones that I was making back in the day where I was, I was basically just trying to sort things out in my head, ideas and thoughts and reasoning that I was having about the big questions at the time in my life when I was sort of getting to the, getting through my me mental development as an adult and really coming into my own as a human being. That was just about purging things and ideas that I had in my head and getting them out in a way that I understood that I could look back on. So for me, it really wasn't about like looking at my videos and being like, oh, I've done fantastically. What a wonderful video. It's really just about 
trying to sort of reason things for myself, but doing it in public. My videos, in some sense, are a gift to the world. Mm -hmm. um, they are, you know, extractions of my own mind that I've done really for my own for my own reasons. But you can watch them if they want, if you want to. That was how I would uh, I would answer that question. Uh, it's not really a it's not really something that um, that bothers me watching my own videos, and it, I don't think it's self centeredness. I just think I like sort of getting my ideas out in a way that I can sort of revisit them. I don't know. I never, I never struggled in that way. I'm afraid. Well, when, when you watch your old sketch videos, you, it, it might be better for you because you have the context of how it was put together. You've, you, you've got the behind the scenes in your head as you watch mm -hmm. it. So you've got more yeah. content context <laughs> going on. Where can people go to find and follow your funny things? Uh, well, it would be my YouTube channel, which is just Jacob Truman. There's also Frag Kratz, which is still uh, an active YouTube channel, I suppose, technically. Um, then I have my TikTok, which is uh, Jacob Truman. My Instagram, which is Jacob Truman. My Twitter, which is The Jacob Truman. And newly, my threads, which is just mm. Jacob Truman. The only one that I don't have uh, as just Jacob Truman is Twitter, which is The Jacob Truman, because somebody took it. <laughs> Bastards. I remember when you used to advertise your stuff and you used to say that you were on Vine. I Yeah, I know. I loved Vine. I miss <laughs> Vine so much. What was Vine? I never used it. Vine was uh, like TikTok, but instead of the videos being super long and highly editable, you literally just had six or seven seconds, I think it was, to fill up your video. And although that seems quite restrictive um, to hear it said out and explain that like that, it meant that you had to work well within these sort of like um, stringent uh, rules that mm. kept the whole platform just very, for the most part, very wholesome, very simple, very directed uh, in a certain way. And it just had its own vibe, man. You see TikToks these days that are like TikToks that have Vine energy. And I'm like, you'll never capture Vine's energy. Mm. You'll never bring that back. Re restraint is, is the mother of creativity. Yeah, that's what they say, isn't it? <laughs> that's that's what I say just now. So, yeah. <laughs> t time to time to get deep. Time to delve into deep thoughts. I have only really been thinking about this recently, as I've been getting more nostalgic of my uh, internet video making history. Um, I have been making videos for as long as you, but I never really thought why I was doing it. I just sort of did it. And a part of the reason why I think I was doing it is that you put out what you want to see in the world. And as mm -hmm. I've said like 10 times now, the reason why uh, critiques of your artistic work hurt so much is because it's you in your work. So it's essentially mm -hmm. a personal attack. And the <laughs> other reason why I think people do this is not necessarily to become famous, but to become immortal. And more I guess, than yeah. I think people would admit, I think a lot of people would wish to live forever. As horrifying as that is, I think more people than who would care to admit to it would mm. wish for that. And in a way, you and I, at least right now, are now immortal because we have this mm -hmm. immortal digital presence recorded thing right here, right now, until the yeah. next solar flare goes off. So in <laughs> your 2009 video, Leighton Way and Pandy Facklerest collaboration interview brackets part one of four end brackets, you said that you were an attention seeker and that stemmed from a fear of being forgotten. Yeah. And I um, what do you think it is about what, what what really is the point and the end goal of chasing this kind of digital fame where you do actually become immortal? Um, I don't know. I mean, you could go back to cliches like Andy Warhol's Everybody Wants 15 Minutes of Fame and stuff like that. Um, I don't know if I'm just repeating myself. I feel like I just, I A, I wanted to discuss things that I was talk, thinking about and wrestling with in my own head. And I was wanting to try and see if I could do that better than some of the videos I saw online. 
And B, yeah, I think on some level I wanted to see, I wanted to get some validation. I wanted to get people looking at my uh, my videos and my opinions and saying, good job, Jacob. Um, I don't know if it's much more, you know, complicated than that. I don't know if they think it has to be. I, it's pretty simple. I, I, I just... I think everybody on some level, apart from perhaps the most misanthropic of individuals, you know, likes to make connections with people, likes to sort of, uh, you know, meet new people and 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 uh, make those kind of uh, links. And maybe doing it digitally, maybe doing it online, there's a there's a sort of like yeah, like you say, immortality to it. Um, I'm ultimately also very much in control of it. Uh, I still have access to these channels and I can do what I want with them. I can upload more. I can private more. Um, it's, I guess it is literally just sort of an extension of my, uh, of the self really that's been ported onto the, into the digital world and can't really be erased, um, Mm -hmm. unless I say it does. And even then very possibly not at that point either. (laughs) Yeah, you know, it's probably going to outlive you, and people become very, immortal very by being yeah. by by being remembered. And yeah, the, I mean the, yeah. the the last the when you die, you physically die, but you actually die when someone remembers you for the last time, and mm-hmm. then you're actually dead. Yep. But this is the thing. I used to work for a. Um, I used to work for a uh, educational edutainment youtube channel called 101 facts i don't know if you've heard of it um and if you don't know for the listeners who don't know it's essentially a youtube channel where people where we upload a, a video every week or we would upload a video every week on a particular given topic could be it was mostly media related so um films tv uh video games stuff like that um but also history and time periods and uh, concepts more generally and I was a researcher on that for that YouTube channel. That was my job. That paid the bills for a while. And one of the things that always really fascinated me was the tiny little minutia of stories that you would find uh, in amongst uh, all these bigger sort of concepts and subjects that we were trying to talk about. And realizing that I was somebody in this century, in this year, in this uh, time uh, looking back on stories that other people had experienced and knowing that for the most part, no one really else knows about this story and that I'm one of the few people who actually knows about a particular tale that happened, an interaction between people. That's a really interesting concept to me. And I think, honestly, this is getting a little bit deeper into my psyche. I think that kind of comforts me. I think knowing that there is at least the possibility that someday in the very distant future when I'm dead and gone, there'll still be somebody who will be able to engage with my thoughts and my ideas and my uh, theories. Uh, Just maybe that keeps me alive. And as long as there's sort of like some distant, tiny fragments of me left, even in digital form, maybe that's living forever. Maybe that's ultimately, maybe that's the whole uh, origin of everything I do online up to this point. It's just making sure that I'm never truly, truly forgotten. I think, yeah, that's true. Now that I think back on it, yeah, my answer from that video you referenced, yeah, I think that's as true today as it was when I said it. Uh, but, but, the, but the question is, Mr. Truman, why are stories important? Oh, God. Why is story? Because that's how we relate to each other. That's how humans have related to each other through, through millennia. Yeah, that's how you transmit information, important information uh, that you need. And it's as basic as, you know, stay away from lions because they'll kill you to this is how you love this is how you comfort this is how you this is how you argue this is how you persuade and stuff like that um i do you think i'm asking you another question do you think that i was telling stories with my videos because they felt very opinionated and like just sort of like rants to be honest i I think uh, so I I think the the story of you and your life is the byproduct of all of your videos being viewed together as a collective, not individually, but the the presence of their existence is the story of your life. Yeah. And what story does it tell is the ultimate question. <laughs> and is it good? And, and shall it... I answer that question? Who knows? <laughs> Go for it. What story? What what's Go the story of what's the story of your life? Jacob Truman. Well, 
with respect to my YouTube career, I suppose mm. it's, I don't know if I've, I'm going to be repeating myself again. I think it's just, you know, I started out just wanting to be, have my voice heard and then it became community based. And then it was very much about uh, comedy. And that in and of itself has always been a manifestation of my desire uh, of just to try and make my brother laugh. Cause I grew up with my brother and that's really how we, a lot of, this is a thing you'll learn, especially people who have close siblings or even twins uh, or, or, or who are, are twins. Um, a lot of the time my, growing up, all I was ever doing was just trying to make Mike laugh. And all that he was ever doing was trying to make me laugh. And I'll get a lot of people say that they don't like the siblings and they don't, they don't get on with the siblings. There was even another set of twins in my school when I was growing up and they didn't really hang out together. But me and Mike got on pretty well, and it was mostly because we had the same sense of humor. So it's all primordial. It's all the inner child, I suppose. All right. Well, I have exhausted all of my questions. So all I can <laughs> oh, say sorry. now is so sorry that I know I, I'm sorry for not for not writing more questions. But all I can say now is thank you for coming on to One Story Building, Jacob Truman. Thank you. This has been a wonderful session of therapy for me. <laughs>